So today we are going to talk about thorium, which is a subject that has really interested me for the better part of 14 years now. Um, now I'm trying something new. If you're, uh, if you know the channel well, you know that this looks different from what I've been trying to do lately. So uh, please stick with me. So thorium as a fuel in nuclear reactors, how it works, why it is useful, and why I think that we should pursue it uh, together with other forms of nuclear fuel, obviously, because I like all nuclear fuels. Let's start at the beginning. So thorium is in essence forged in stars. So what you get in these stars is there's fusion of hydrogen and helium and uh, all, all sorts of other elements, and it goes up until iron. And at one point when the sun is heavy with iron and doesn't have any hydrogen or helium left to form its fusion with, then it's basically dying. So what happens is at some point you get a, a massive explosion. It, it first implodes in on itself and then you get a massive explosion, a supernova. And this supernova event is basically, basically when uh, the uranium is forged and when the thorium is forged. So what happens is all this immense power that is released during this massive explosion basically hammers together some of the atoms and, and turns them into heavier atoms, which basically become solar batteries, so to speak. So uranium and thorium, those are the ultimate batteries that nature has given us after a supernova. So how is thorium different from uranium? Now, some people would say that thorium is a better fuel than uranium, or other people say that it is preferable to, to uranium. Now, it's pretty simple. Uh, I will boil it down to the basics. I'm ambivalent to which one is better than the other, uh, but I do see some advantages in using one over the other, but I also see advantages in using, for instance, uranium instead of thorium. But in the end, I think that we shouldn't have to choose. It's there, we can just use it. So thorium has uh, 90 protons, uranium has 92 protons. Uh, the neutrons, thorium has 142, uranium has 143 or 146 when we're talking about the stuff that you can find in nature. The interesting bit about thorium is that it is not fissile, um, which means that it won't split if it, if it absorbs a thermalized neutron. Now, uranium-235 is is fissile and uranium-238 is not fissile. So uranium-238 and thorium-232, they look a lot, lot alike. Um, when we look at the abundance of thorium versus uranium, we see that there's a lot more thorium on the planet. Uh, it's, it's almost, it's more than three times as much. Uh, but that doesn't mean that there's not enough uranium for us to, you know, use practically forever. Uh, both resources are virtually inexhaustible. Now, the drawbacks with, uh, for instance, thorium is that you really need a seed. You need a, a, a source of neutrons that, that starts the breeding cycle. Because each time a thorium atom absorbs a neutron, that neutron cannot split another atom anymore. So you need something that has a, a sufficient supply of neutrons. So this, this means that your fissile content inside the reactor, so it's either the uranium-235 that you need in the reactor, or the content of plutonium-239, for instance, you could also start a, a, a reactor like this with plutonium-239, needs to be sufficient in order to start the breeding cycle and to make sure that you have sufficient neutrons to keep this process going. And, and, and the thing about, you know, Uranium-235, if you want to use that as your principal fuel in a nuclear reactor, is that you need enrichment. So in essence, you need enrichment for both. It's, it's, it's just unavoidable. Now, this is one of my things. Uh, I, I have been looking at different names for it. A lot of tanium, a lot tanium. I mean, let's say a lotium. Uh, why use thorium? This is, this is my personal... Uh, my personal view on this matter, uh, it is there. We get it as a waste product from mining. Uh, we get it um, 
you know, it is a problem in the mining world. So there's a lot of companies that want to mine rare earth elements, for instance, like neodymium and dysprosium. And uh, there's there's a lot of those elements out there that have a lot of practical uses in, in, in all kinds of technologies. And you always get the, the, these uh, minerals that contain these these elements they always contain some some amount of thorium they always come together and it, that's a problem for the mining world because now basically what they are doing is they're extracting nuclear materials and they simply don't have a license to produce these and they don't know what to do with them so basically what you do is you you, you don't start mining at all um they have been looking for minerals that don't contain thorium but that's very hard and those are very rare the irony is that the rare earth materials are not rare and finding thorium together with them isn't rare either so so thorium is there it is a problem to the mining industry um i believe that there's a task and purpose for everything on the, on this world whatever we find in nature thorium is among the most useful things we find but which we treat as something extremely hazardous or dangerous just because it is mildly radioactive so i think that we should use thorium as a fuel together with uranium i mean we already have the supply chain why throw away the uranium supply chain but since we want to open up more mining opportunities it will be better to also start collecting all this thorium, putting it in a bank, putting it in a, in, in a resource center of some sort, and start thinking about how we can put it to good use. And there's more uses for thorium than just uh, making energy out of it. I know that you can use it in, in alloy production and such, but I mean, all of that is basically people are very hands off -y on this issue because they don't like to touch radioactive stuff, which is dumb, but you know, that's just us nuclear nerds. So how does fission work? Most of the people who watch this channel already know this, but for those who have been drawn into this video because of the thorium angle, it's quite simple. You have a fissile atom in this case uranium-235 but it can also be uranium-233 and it can also be plutonium-239 so what happens is a neutron comes in it gets absorbed by the atom the atom was already unstable but now the additional neutron has created more instability so the the atom basically splits in two big parts and it also releases energy you know the energy that was required to keep all those protons and neutrons sticking together some of that some of that energy is released and and you get a couple of neutrons and maybe some other stuff and what you want is those neutrons that come out of this fission reaction to go on to find a new fissile atom a new fissile isotope whichever one it is and perform the same action now, if you want to know how thorium does this, it's a little bit tricky to understand at first, but once you see what happens, it's pretty pretty easy to, to understand. So thorium in itself is fertile. This means that whenever it absorbs a neutron, it turns into something else. And it doesn't become fissile straight away. So I've made this little diagram here. As you can see, thorium-232, which, uh, uh, which has a nucleus, 90 protons and 142 neutrons. It absorbs a neutron, which came from another fission reaction somewhere else. This means that it gets plus one neutron, which means that it turns into thorium-233 because the number of protons remains the same. So first, at first it turns into uh so at first it turns into thorium-233 with 90 protons and 143 neutrons did this has introduced an imbalance in this atom you know the binding energies are a bit off whack so what happens now is something very arcane to me personally i i really need to look into how this works 
but basically what you got is beta decay. And when beta decay occurs, one of the neutrons that is inside this nucleus turns into a proton and it releases an electron, which then gets captured by the cloud of the atom, you know, the, the electron cloud. So once this has happened, it has turned into protactinium-233. Now, protactinium-233 is still not fissile. So if it gets hit with a thermal neutron, it still does not fission. But we still have the same imbalance. The atom really wants to start, you know, balancing out. So what it does, it does another beta decay, which means that one neutron transforms into a proton and an electron gets ejected from the core. And that's the moment when protactinium-233 changes into uranium-233. And this is a fissile atom, a fissile isotope of uranium. It now has 92 protons and 141 neutrons. And if this successfully takes up a neutron, then it splits into two parts, plus the energy that it releases, plus the neutrons that it releases. So that's how we can use thorium as a fuel, in essence. Now, if you want to know everything about thorium reactors, molten salt reactors, because the molten salt reactor has always been closely uh, associated. A lot of people associate the molten salt reactor with thorium. Now, it, it's not necessarily a bonded pair because you can do thorium in other reactors as well. And a molten salt reactor can run exclusively on uranium if you want it to. But if you want to know a lot more about molten salt reactors, about thorium, then there is a, an excellent conference coming to Abilene in Texas on April 14th and 15th. There are still opportunities to go and enlist, uh, register for going there. Uh, I, I really suggest you you do that if you if if you haven't already, because what you can see at take twelve is actually the birthplace of the second real molten salt reactor that will get built in the United States, and that's the first molten salt reactor to start up since the late 60s i mean this is really something interesting and really something worthwhile to do i personally cannot go because i have other uh stuff that goes on in the netherlands i am i am the 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 chairman of an ngo we have a lot of um activities in the netherlands uh, communicating nuclear to policymakers and such so unfortunately i cannot go i had to cancel uh, but I really suggest that you'd go. It's really a, a very nice experience and you will become a lot smarter thanks to that visit. And I hope that you take something away from it. Maybe get active in the community, uh, start actively uh, campaigning for nuclear, for the use of thorium, for the use of molten salt reactors, for instance. Now, um, why support this channel? Uh, as you can see, things are different, especially for the people who know this channel. Um, the reason why it's different is because the production value that I was pouring into the video lately was uh, taking a lot of time. Uh, it, it took me four, sometimes even five days to produce such videos. Uh, and unfortunately, that's, that's simply something I cannot do. Um, the, the 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 my 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 health and my family uh, need me too and my ngo needs me too so but i still want to make these videos i'm going to talk to some people to see whether we can uh cooperate whether we can do some other stuff to make more interesting informational videos so that we can learn uh you know everything that we can about the nuclear industry about energy about climate change uh, so the reason why I'm asking for support, which you can do in, in Patreon, is because I have no other job. The NGO that I have is a uh, what we call an, an ANBI, which means that people who are um, 
like the chairman and the 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 the, the uh, treasurer the treasurer and the guy who does all the the communications they can't get paid it's 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 impossible by law so so this youtube channel is the only income i have i have two sons they my youngest son is turning 10 this year my oldest son is turning 14 this year so they are now in uh, the period in which they start you know eating more they need more clothes they are going to school schools are becoming increasingly more expensive so you you would help me out there um and obviously i mean i live in a house it, it needs maintenance so whatever you can do to help there would be greatly appreciated now these are my personal heroes and i'm going to read them out to you aloud uh, because i haven't done so and i think that i have to thank these people personally is okay here we go this is canon brian that's the anthropocene institute and i really have to thank carl page there uh then we have romek pavlovich i hope i don't butcher your name uh christopher bergen timothy maloney then there's eric meyer anton tapani then there's daniel c brian campbell meredith angwin Ripudama Malotra, Andrew K, Lord Andy K, Cameron Lennox, Alan Metzger, Stephen, Carl Alex Pauls, Peter Rummer, Todd Dereich, Chris Kiefer, then there's the humanist skeptic, Gordon McDowell, Marco Frisser, Illyrian, Stefan Nikolov, Wrexham, Royce Southern, Julian Zimele Griffith, Ben Booth Carolan, then there's the Thorium Energy World, Johannes Ross, Ken Cadera, the climate scientist, then there's Emil, he lives in my town and we are going to do more stuff together, but it's going to be in Dutch, then there's Eric Freire, and then there's Steve. Now, a lot of these people might sound familiar to you, that's because some of them are also very active in the nuclear advocacy space. And I'm very grateful for their support. Now I'm going to try to keep up a, a, a better uploading regime. I want to share more basic information with you. I want to share more calculating, you know, more stuff in which I do calculations so you can reproduce that and use that in your own advocacy. And uh, let's hope that we can make a better world together. Now may the strong force be with you. Wow.